In this lesson, we're talking about Baker's cysts. So we're going to talk about why they happen, the pathophysiology behind why they occur. We'll talk about the signs and symptoms, how they're diagnosed, and how they're treated. So Baker's cysts are also known as popliteal cysts. They are fluid-filled sacs or cysts that occur behind the knee. So they're going to occur in the popliteal fossa. The popliteal fossa is located behind the knee. So here is the popliteal fossa in this location. We'll talk about the muscles in more detail that delineate the popliteal fossa in the next slide when we talk about the anatomy in more detail. So some Baker cysts can occur due to an increase in the size of what we call the gastronemio semimembranous bursa or the GS bursa. So a bursa is a fluid-filled sac, and this particular bursa is located between the semimembranosus and medial head of the gastrocnemius muscle. And this bursa is going to be located more specifically in the medial aspect of the popliteal fossa. And a lot of times, the popliteal cyst or the Baker cyst is due to a fluid distension of this bursa. Now, Baker cyst is actually the most common cause of a mass behind the knee. It's associated with other knee conditions, and this is going to be important because some of these include knee osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and meniscal tears. And along with these other knee conditions, a Baker cyst may occur due to knee injury or overuse. So essentially, anything that causes injury or damage to the knee and knee structures can actually increase the risk of getting a Baker cyst. So that's important, and we're going to talk about the pathophysiology in more detail later on in this lesson. And due to some of these knee conditions and knee injuries over time, the prevalence of Baker cysts actually increases with increasing age. So let's talk about the anatomy in more detail here so we can better understand the pathophysiology in the next slide. So we showed this diagram before. Here is the popliteal fossa. And this side of the leg is the medial side, and this is the lateral side. And the popliteal fossa is going to be demarcated by several muscles. One of them is going to be the semitendinosus muscle. So this is the semitendinosus muscle here. The semimembranosus muscle, which is this muscle here. The biceps femoris on the lateral side, that's going to demarcate the lateral edge of the popliteal fossa. And then the medial head of the gastrocnemius muscle and the lateral head of the gastrocnemius muscle are going to account for the lower half or the inferior aspect of the popliteal fossa. So these are going to be the muscles that are the borders of the popliteal fossa. Now the pathophysiology of this condition again involves an enlargement of that GS bursa we talked about before and can involve fluid distension due to other causes as well. Some of these again include trauma to the GS bursa resulting in enlargement of that bursa. So this is an enlarged GS bursa here. There can be a development of a communication between a joint and a cyst. So if there's any joint fluid and there's some connection due to some trauma or injury, the fluid from the joint can enter and enlarge the cyst and we can get a Baker cyst due to that reason. A joint capsule can herniate into the popliteal fossa and that can cause a Baker cyst. And pressure changes within the knee joint itself can also cause a popliteal cyst as well. And then a valve can form between a joint space and a cyst that leads to fluid being trapped within the popliteal fossa. So as we can see, there are multiple pathophysiological pathways that can lead to a popliteal cyst. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of Baker's cysts. The majority of them are asymptomatic, meaning that they have no signs or symptoms. So a majority of cases will simply have a cyst or a mass bulging in the back of the knee or the posterior aspect of the knee. In other cases, they can be large enough to cause joint tightness. So there can be issues with movement of the knee, and there can be joint discomfort in the knee in some cases as well. So those are going to be the clinical findings of a Baker cyst, mostly going to be that mass behind the knee, and in some cases, there's going to be knee joint tightness and discomfort. But there are other associated signs and symptoms that can occur that depend on associated conditions. So there can be knee pain if there is any knee joint degeneration due to rheumatoid arthritis or knee osteoarthritis. And then what can also occur in some patients is a rupturing of that cyst. So that ball of fluid can actually burst and can actually lead to a swelling of the leg. And in some patients, it can actually look like or may appear like a deep vein thrombosis or a DVT. So you can imagine if there's a lot of fluid in behind the knee and it bursts, that fluid can extend into the interstitial areas in and around the knee and into some of the other parts of the leg and it can look like a more swollen leg. And a unilaterally swollen leg is going to be a red flag for a DVT. So it can look like a DVT, but it's actually a ruptured Baker cyst. How do clinicians diagnose and treat Baker's cysts? 
So the diagnosis is often going to be clinical diagnosis. So the way to do this is have the patient standing and have their knee fully extended so you can actually see the bulge or the mass behind the knee. In some cases, if they have their knee flexed, they may actually not be able to see the mass. And there is a clinical sign that can be observed in patients with Baker's cyst, and that is known as Foucher's sign or Foucher's sign. And this is where the cyst actually completely disappears when the knee is flexed at a 45 degree angle. So if you have them standing, they have their knee fully flexed, you can see the mass, and if they actually were to bend their knee, flex their knee to a 45 degree angle, you don't see the cyst or the mass anymore, that would be Fouché sign. Imaging can be used to diagnose this condition as well. If imaging is used for another case, like knee osteoarthritis, you may actually see a Baker cyst. So plain radiography can be utilized. Ultrasonography can be utilized to see the fluid as well. And magnetic resonance imaging of the knee can also be used as well to see that fluid, that cyst in behind the knee. And once a clinician diagnoses this condition, how do they treat it? Most of the time, again, because it's asymptomatic, it's not going to be treated that extensively. If it's symptomatic, it's going to be more likely to be treated. Oftentimes it's going to be modification of activity. So if there is any particular physical activity that may be exacerbating an underlying injury in the knee, there may be need for modification of that activity and more rest may be required to help reduce the size of the Baker cyst. non anti-inflammatories or NSAIDs for pain relief may be used. So ibuprofen would be one of them. A steroid injection may be used in some patients. And in other patients, aspiration of the cyst. So it's going to be ultrasound guided and this may actually help reduce the size of the cyst. Now it's usually not possible to completely remove all of it, but this can help with regards to bringing down the size of the cyst, and especially in patients who have issues with knee tightness and discomfort. And then in other very severe cases, surgery may be employed, and this is going to be open cyst excision. I hope you found this lesson helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching, and hope to see you next time.